Uh, so today we're here to share uh, some recent projects that the Wikimedia Fellows are working on and also hopefully give you a little bit of a taste of the fellowship program. Uh, so each fellow is basically going to go through and uh, speak a little bit about a project that they're working on right now, and then uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for a Q&A, both any questions you have about individual projects as well as the program, what it's like to be like a, a fellow, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Fellows Program funds community members for up to one year to work on projects uh, that are experimental, research, or sort of pilot projects in nature. And uh, in addition to some financial support, we also offer some logistical support and a little bit of human support, thought partnership, that kind of thing. The 2010 theme of fellowship projects is boosting participation and retention. And what that basically means is that current projects are looking to sustain and grow Wikimedia communities, uh, particularly the editing community. And we're looking for new ways to increase participation. So this year we have six fellows. And uh, five of them are here today. Unfortunately, Tanvir Rahman wasn't able to get his visa to come from Bangladesh. We're not happy about that. But uh, meanwhile, we have a lot of, of great projects to, to tell you about. There's a photo of Tanvir because he's here in spirit with all of us. And uh, here's one slide on his project. We just wanted to make sure that, that uh, you got a little taste of what he's working on. He is uh, working on the Small Wiki Editor Engagement Project, which is basically a project that is experimenting with ways to grow a, a small-sized editing community. Uh, and in particular, he's working uh, initially on the Bangla community. Uh, as you can see, Bangla is uh, a very large potential reading community, very small number of editors, very small number of articles. Uh, so he's been doing some research so far to look at sort of what are the barriers to participation. And uh, next up is working on some solutions, including running banners to, to turn readers into editors and, uh, and you know, reworking the help systems and so on and so forth. Oh, we'll save that one. No, we won't. We'll just talk about it now. Uh, if, if you're interested in what you hear today and in what all of these fellows are, are going to tell you about, I would encourage you to get involved with the program. Uh, we're, we now have applications open for 2013 fellowships. You can submit an application for yourself. You can suggest a project idea for someone else to take on because we're also sort of collecting ideas for new fellowship projects to work on. Uh, and you can also help us review projects and, and decide which fellowships to fund by, uh, by endorsing or giving feedback on a project. So these are uh, the program pages that may be of interest to you. That's my email address, Seiko Bouters. I work at the Wikimedia Foundation, head of fellowships. I'm going to introduce our fellows really quickly. Uh, first up on this side, this gentleman is Steven Zhang. Next to him is Peter Coom. Then we have Sarah Sturch, Yoon Harold Sobi, and Jonathan Morgan. And uh, first up to talk to us is Peter Coombe, who's working on some really interesting help project redesign. Okay, so I'm Peter. Um, some of you might know me from various wikis as The Wub. Um, and I'm a community fellow working on redesigning the English Wikipedia's help pages. Um, so Wikipedia's become quite a complex place over time. So having good help documentation is absolutely essential if we want to attract and retain users. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people are aware that our help pages are not exactly the best in the world. Um, there's a number of different problems with them. Um, first is they're just too long. I mean, Wikipedia citing sources is one of the most viewed help pages, and obviously it's crucial to everything we do, and it's 8,000 words long. And that's not just an isolated example. There's loads of these pages which are thousands of words long. Um, they're widely varying in complexity. so. If you're a new user who wants to, um, if you're a new user who wants to um, come and find out what an edit summary is and clicks on the edit summary thing that you see, um, you probably don't want to know exactly which media wiki message you change, which defines the auto-generated summary for page blanking. That's something only a very few administrators are going to want to know, but we tell you that anyway on the edit summary page. Um, We've got a lot of cruft come up over time. Um, I found a help page a few weeks ago which was just about how to draw chemical structures using ASCII art. 
and oh, it's not going to come up. There, that one. Um, lovely. Uh, so I thought that's nice. It's from. It's obviously from a long time ago. It's from. It was in, made in 2003. Things were a bit different then. And I did a bit of hunting around. And I asked the people at Wiki Project Chemicals, and they said, "No, we've never encouraged this. This has always been something we didn't want." So, like. We had this page which was telling you to how to do something which was against all the guidelines and had always been against all the guidelines. So, yeah, I deleted that. Um, and then the final thing is the navigation is poor, which you'll see on the next slide. So what does the current help system look like? This is going to take a while to load, probably. There we go. Something like that. Um, thanks to Oliver Keys for doing this picture. He tells me it almost broke his computer generating it. Each of these nodes is a help page, and these are the main links between them. Um, the colors indicate readability, I believe. Um, I'm not sure which is more or less readable. But yes, um, obviously it's very tangled. Um, and there's many ways into this maze of help pages. So some people come in via the Wikipedia search box. Um, some people click on the help link in the sidebar. Some people get warnings and welcome messages on their talk page and come in through there. And some are just templates on articles and things. And we've got lots of different use cases as well. Like most pages, or some of the pages are aimed at readers. Some of the pages are aimed at new editors. Some are aimed at experienced editors, and most are just a jumble of all three. So if you click on the help link in the sidebar, this is the page it takes you to. Um, this is what you'll see. It's called Help Contents, and it's really just that. It's a contents page. There's no welcome, no explanation of what the, or proper explanations of what these things are. Um, and every time I look at this, I find new things to hate about it. So here we've got... Um, I mean, if you look over on the right side, the Wikipedia community submit or debate a proposal. And if you click on that, it's nothing to do with that. It's a list of random community links, like the signpost and things like that, and the village pump. Um, so the only verbose bit of this is the tip of the day, which had to be cut off here because the slide's not, the screen wasn't big enough. But I mean, if you're lucky, that might be useful. If it's November the 10th, then you get an explanation of how to search Wikipedia using Lycos, because they haven't been updated in so long. And even when, even when it is a useful tip, it's probably not what you were looking for when you clicked on help. You were probably looking for something specific, rather than just a random piece of information. There is some fairly, there's some fairly useful links up at the top, um, with the Welcome to Wikipedia and the Help Desk and Ask Questions, uh, IRC Chat. but People put so much effort into making this bit, the bit below it, big and simple, everyone skips over the bit at the top. Um, so if you're a new user and you come to this page, you're probably going to click Getting Started. Getting Started, an introduction. And this will take you to this, which isn't an introduction. It's a lot of introductions. Uh, there's some over there and some here and some things which aren't introductions and there's no explanations of anything. So, obviously I don't like the help pages, but what do users think of them? Um, well, we just conducted a big survey. Um, we tried to get users uh, from all, of all experience levels, from zero edits to thousands of edits. Um, I don't have time to go over all the results, but if you're interested, you can visit the help project, and we have all the results up there. It's finally done. I've finally finished analyzing them all. Um, a few things that stood out. The most popular topics among new users, uh, unsurprisingly, how to edit, and how do I start a new page about my awesome band? Um, what is surprising <laughs> is that people actually rate the help on those OK. I mean, it's not, they don't, they're not amazed with them, but they're generally better than the other topics we looked at. Uh, so the other thing is the worst rated topics are how to add references and how to add images. 
both of which are obviously kind of important to what we do. And that's, that's fairly consistent across all experience ranges. So new users and even experienced users find the help on referencing an image is not very good. So this is one of my favorite quotes. I've had some free form text entry for the survey. One of my favorite quotes that I got from it was, I was helped by people, not help pages. Um, it's, uh, a lot of the findings in the survey were quite murky, but one of the very clear things that jumped out was that experienced editors love asking questions of other users on their talk pages. Um, but newbies don't do it. They don't even know that it's an option. Um, so one thing that's been or ongoing re recently is the E3 team are working on new warning messages, and um, I think that's going to be a big help because they, the new ones invite you very, very clearly to respond to the person who left the message on their talk page, whereas for some reason, and I always thought, I always thought the old ones did, but apparently they don't. So I think that would be a big help because obviously lots of people get warned every day. Um, but if you're new, then how to use a talk page is confusing. I know there's, there's plans for software improvements, but those are going to take time to come. So in the meantime, we need to introduce users to how to use a talk page, how to reply, how to sign your posts, that kind of thing. And that's where I found help introduction to talk pages, which looks like this. And this is a page I actually like. Um, there's screenshots. It's got a clear flow of where you go next after you've finished reading that. Um, there aren't links all over the place for you to click and get distracted. I'm sure you've done the thing with articles where you start out on something and then click and click and then don't know how you ended up on the page you're at. Well, the same thing happens with help pages. It doesn't cover anything that's too complicated that you don't need to know. And there's actually a few pages like this that have been started up, and they're all called Help Introduction To. So I've talked a lot about the help pages at the moment, and now I want to talk about what I'm going to do as part of my fellowship to try and improve that and what I'm doing. Um, so I'm not going to be able to do it on my own. It's a huge job, and I have a six-month fellowship, and even if I had a six-year fellowship, I couldn't do it on my own. Um, so I've put a lot of work into restarting the Wikipedia Help Project, which did already exist, but it was a bit dormant. Um, so now it's back up and running. We have a nice, shiny new page and a newsletter. And if anyone is interested in helping, then please go to Wikipedia Help Project and sign up. Um, I said I like the introduction to pages, so I'm going to do more of those, because I think they're a great idea, and I want to steal it. Um, so because these were the things that people really seem to have problems with, I want to do one on referencing, one on images, and one on orientation, which would basically be how to search for things, what namespaces are, just because when you first get to Wikipedia, it's kind of confusing, and that's what I've heard from all the, all the people I've spoken to. Um, and also, want to make sure these have good navigation between them. Um, so working on breadcrumbs, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, the reason I'm going to be working on these introduction things is because they're modular and self-contained and we can have them for new users in parallel with the old ones. Because sometimes you do need to know where to go to edit the media wiki message to do the blah 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 um, After all that's done, and this is ongoing, I've started on these and been working on them, although unfortunately I don't have any to show today. Um, after that, the big job is going to be entirely revamping help contents and moving it from, it may not even be called help contents anymore, it may get a different name, um, moving it from what it is at the moment, which is a bear index, to just a central starting point with basically asking people what they want to do. Do you want to learn more about editing or about how Wikipedia works, all that kind of thing. And all these changes, I'm going to be backing with usability testing, getting real people to sit down in front of the new, the new and the old pages and see what they think of them. 
and that's it. Um, I think we're going to take questions at the end altogether. So, okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Sturch. And I'm Jonathan Morgan. <laughs> and I'm a community fellow, and he is a... Research fellow. We're not quite the same, but we're not that different. And we have combined our powers to create a project called The Tea House. How many of you here are familiar with The Tea House? Raise your hand. All right. That's a good ratio. How many of you have actually participated in The Tea House? All right. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. How many of you are new editors who participated in the Tea House? Yeah, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> new editors that are at Micomania who visit the Tea House. It's like remarkable, right? Um, so the Tea House uh, spawned out of uh, the need for these things. Uh, we, <laughs> the, the need. Um, we wanted to create a really unique space that would provide a, a healthy, friendly environment where new editors and experienced editors could learn how to edit Wikipedia collaboratively through peer-to-peer -peer support. We're also, by decreasing intimidation, reaching out to new editors, specifically women, and of course, increasing new user uh, and new editor retention uh, through that process. So peer-to-peer -peer support is a little bit different than most uh, Wikipedia sp help spaces. Uh, generally, it's through a mentoring process, or it is through a um, uh, a self-help process, so what Peter was talking about, we go through and we look through those help pages and it's a solitary experience, or maybe even through IRC, but most new editors don't even know how to use IRC and many experienced editors don't either. Um, and peer-to-peer -peer support is incredibly healthy for a lot of people. Uh, we like to work together collaboratively. I mean, we're writing a collaborative encyclopedia, so why not garner that help when it, learning how to edit together? Decreasing intimidation by having an aesthetically attractive space, which is based on the color scheme you see here. Uh, it not only changes the look of Wikipedia to something warm, calming, and different, but you can sit down and have a cup of wiki tea and get to know some of the other people who are editing Wikipedia alongside you. Um, also in terms of in decreasing intimidation, making the uh, way that you interact in this space clear and easy. Um, editing is hard, wiki text is intimidating for new editors, um, and interacting with experienced editors is intimidating for new editors, especially considering that many of their initial interactions with experienced editors, as uh, those of you who were in the template testing uh, session earlier uh, know, um, are often negative. So the idea of decreasing the intimidation of both the technology and the interface with the community was one of our core goals. And if we're able to also increase the participation of, of women in our projects through that, uh, we feel like we have succeeded. So a little bit about the Tea House. Uh, this is what you see when you visit the Tea House on English Wikipedia. It doesn't quite look like Wikipedia, I think. This is the Wikipedia of my dreams. Colors, aesthetic design, ease of usability, and friendly people all coming together to share the sum of all the world's knowledge. And thank you, Heather Walls. Where's Heather? The amazing Heather Walls is the woman who designed the look and feel of the Tea House. If you attended any of the hackathons in Berlin or in San Francisco, she designed the really cool hackathon pages too. So, um, so when you are invited to the Tea House, we, Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about how we find the editors who uh, come to the Tea House. But we've sort of, fo we haven't sort of, we have focused on the power of invitation, which has been shown to not only um, increase the participation of women in spaces, so I'm inviting you to a party. I'm inviting you to edit Wikipedia. So when we find people who are new editors, and Jonathan will talk about that, we invite them to the tea house with a really beautifully designed template. And when they, are, uh, they, they need help, they come by and visit us, and this is what they see. You have three spaces for calls to action. You can ask a question right now, which is our main intention and goal, to help you answer your question. And then is the next slide. Okay. And so, well, you can go back really quick and... Um, oh, go I've got slides. For okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there, th as Sarah was saying, there are three. There, there, there are basically uh, a couple of a couple of main calls to action for the tea house. Um, the first one, and the one that most of our guests ended up using, was our Q and A board, um, because the tea house is a peer support space, uh, and we're reaching out to new users who have a lot of questions, who need a lot of support. Uh, we decided to go with a question and answer model. Um, but we wanted to make it a rich experience and an easy experience, rather rather than just um, uh, you know, 
asking a question, getting the, the minimum possible answer, um, and then going on your way. Uh, so our first step to that was to have a set of norms and policies that, that uh, Sarah generated um, for interacting, or norms of behavior, not policies, uh, for interacting with new editors on the tea house. Um, so uh, we had a set, we, we recruited initially uh, and then have since encouraged the joining of a set of hosts, volunteer Wikipedians who uh, answer questions on the Q&A board, who invite new editors to the Tea House, who welcome editors, um, and who support a, uh, a, an encouraging and non-intimidating, a welcoming atmosphere. Um, as you can see in some of these examples up here, uh, editors get in-depth help. Um, they often get multiple answers to their questions. Um, they get notifications on their talk pages that their question has been answered. And they often come back and ask follow-up questions or engage in a discussion around their original one. They also get welcomed. Um, you know, hello, welcome, great to see you here. Um, rather than simply uh, a response that uh, links to a policy and, uh, and kind of leaves them to fend for themselves. Um, one other feature of the Q&A board, um, and our only deviation from the standard media wiki, um, is the Tea House gadget, um, which is a little JavaScript pop-up box that appears when you ask a question. Uh, this was uh, designed for us by Andrew Garrett, uh, and he gave uh, uh, Wordna, user Wordna. Um, and uh, it makes the uh, ability, it gives new users who may not be all that familiar with uh, editing wiki text and may be intimidated by it, an easy way to get their question out there. Uh, some subsequent interactions, answering questions, responding to a response, are, are taken care of by clicking the edit button just like everything else. And uh, yeah, we, we're very excited about this project, so we're just kind of jumping back and forth. So um, some really unique things about this template. So there's a button down here, the ask my question button. And you know, one of uh, the favorite things new, new Wikipedians like to forget to do is sign their post. And of course, we have bots that go around and do that for them. And we have that very friendly template that reminds them they better do it in the future, right? Because what, they'll get banned or something? So no, it's, it's, it's an attempt at educating them on how to sign their, their, their posts. So that button does not light up until you sign your post. And we have, obviously, some instructions on how to do that. Um, and and that's, it's been great. We have a lot of people sign their posts, obviously, because they can't answer their question. And the other unique thing is that it top posts. So like the rest of the internet, new things go to the top. It's this really weird concept. And it, it has caused a little bit of a stink in the community, but it's been really great, and we don't have a flood of new editors running around top posting all over Wikipedia. So don't worry, it's okay. Um, but it's, it's nice, so go ahead. All right, next up, uh, we have our intros page. Um, this is the other main call to action for guests of the Tea House when they arrive. Um, we, uh, we thought this would be a, would, would be a great way to um, show guests uh, that there are other people like, their, uh, like them out there. Um, and so we created a relatively easy process for creating a templated introduction. Say something about yourself. Uh, choose a picture that you feel represents you or you think it's funny or cute. We did end up getting a lot of cute animal pictures, by the way, although some of, although some of them we kind of seeded into the mix. Um, and uh, we got a great response from this. We got about 200, uh, in, during the pilot period, about 200 uh, new editors creating intros for themselves. Uh, the, yeah, and the pilot period was a three-month pilot. And then, uh, and then also, uh, guests are invited to see the people who, are, who are, they're going to be interacting with here at the Tea House, our wonderful Tea House hosts. Uh, do we have any hosts in the audience tonight? Rick Keeper, here he is. There's Rick there Keeper. There he is. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and the, host, the hosts were also invited to say something about themselves. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what happened during the pilot period. Um, we ran the pilot from February 27th to the 31st of May. And uh, over this period of time, we had 586 editors, that's both new editors and veterans, participating in the Tea House. 68% of, of our editors were new editors. Um, and in this case, uh, we're defining a new editor as somebody whose account was created in 2012 um, or, uh, uh, or who has less than 100 edits at the time that they first participated in the Q&A board or the introductions page. Um, we invited, and actually I should say that Sarah and Rosie Stepp, mostly, um, invited, 
<laughs> invited uh, over 7,000 uh, new editors. Um, and these were new editors, not just a random sampling of new account creators, but actually uh, people who had created, uh, who had made at least 10 edits within their first 24 hours and who were not blocked. Um, so uh, this, was, this was based on some studies we saw that, these were, that this was a core set of users who were more likely than average um, for new users to go on to become productive Wikipedians. Um, Unfortunately, only we, we got a fairly low response rate, even from this even from this subset of new editors. Um, so this illustrates that uh, outreach to, to newbies is hard. Um, people uh, and people give up on Wikipedia really quickly. Um, whether that's because they're intimidated by the interaction or the software, or because they were never that serious to begin with, is something that can, can't be determined universally. Um, but there's a lot of factors involved. Also, we, because I know someone will probably ask this question, we did attempt to put it on some of the welcome templates, like the generic ones that we drop off to welcome newbies, but there was a, uh, some discussion on the talk pages that uh, that wouldn't be good because we kind of scaled it to focus on promising new editors with a 10 edit mark, and of course the welcome template gets added to almost everybody's uh, welcome. And that's since changed. It has been brought to welcome templates and, and some of the help spaces like Peter sh has shown, so. Cool. Um, also had a bunch of hosts participating, um, and they just keep getting better, and we keep getting more of them. So uh, in that respect, it makes me more and more excited to be part of the Tea House every day. Uh, over the course of the pilot, we had over 500 questions asked on the Q&A board, and 71% of those questions were asked by new editors. Um, and, and roughly 60% of those questions were asked by people who had been explicitly invited to participate in the Tea House. Um, the median response time for questions was 29 minutes. This is lightning fast. Um, and yes, I've, done, I've, I've run the numbers. It is, in fact, faster on average than the help desk. 25% um, of the people who asked questions asked multiple questions. So we had a lot of repeat visitors, people who came and asked questions uh, enjoyed, enjoyed their experience and found it useful and showed that by coming back. Uh, over 200 uh, uh, intro boxes created. Um, profiles is a dirty word. I don't know how it ended up on this slide. Um, and uh, uh, I suggest actually, if you're curious about what new editors on Wikipedia are like, go to the Tea House uh, guest page and start looking through. It's amazing to see, um, it's amazing to see who, who we're getting. And make your own. Um, we also did a survey to see how well uh, new, e new editors and also experienced editors who participated in the Tea House in one way or another, uh, how they found that experience. Um, so one of our questions was just a kind of a satisfaction index, you know, how rate your level of satisfaction with the Tea House. Um, for, for new editors, it was, uh, it was quite high. So we have, we have o all over 70% of new editors rated their experience. Um, uh, satisfied or very satisfied, um, and, and only 5% uh, of our sample uh, said they were dissatisfied. Um, the numbers are almost identical um, for experienced editors. We, again, we have 70% uh, of the participating editors really enjoyed what uh, the experience they had. We also ran a sample, since, we, since the whole purpose of the Tea House is to Engage new editors and increase retention. We actually did some. We actually did some uh, some controlled or semi-controlled studies to uh, try to ascertain whether participating in the tea house um, uh, is is correlated with uh, a greater number of subsequent edits um, and a longer uh, sustained uh, participation. Um, so uh, a lot of this stuff is, is documented on Wiki, um, and I won't go over to the details because they're kind of tedious. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to talk to, and, and happy to talk to anybody about this at any time. I'm a research geek, it's what I do. Um, but we found that um, uh, we exceeded, at least uh, in the short term, all of our expectations. Um, so uh, following up on a sample of Tea House uh, participants against two different control groups, we found that uh, participants made 10 times as many article edits after participating than the control groups who did not participate. Um, they made seven times more global edits to all namespaces. Um, and uh, over twice as much of, their con of the content they contributed survives, was not overwritten or reverted um, during the pilot period. Um, so this, is, this suggests, uh, and, and furthermore, we found that 33% of our guests uh, were still active at, at the end of the pilot period um, compared with control samples who joined it around the same time. 
So this suggests that at least in the short term, we may be contributing to uh, um, retention and increasing engagement with editing. Um, now obviously we're, gonna, we're going to be continuing to run these retention metrics against the control samples uh, as time goes on and seeing if this trend continues. Because um, right now we're looking at a very short time frame. Now Sarah is gonna, get, uh, gonna give, uh, give you a taste of some of the feedback we got from uh, participants of all, of all kinds. And I did just want to add a real quick note about the research. Um, obviously, Jonathan's the research fellow. That's why he got to handle that section for me. But one little piece of research that I find particularly exciting is that 28% of the participants at the Tea House are women, which is obviously up a little bit from a little number known as 9%. So I think we might be on the right track, at least in one area. And uh, I think it's very exciting. So we've been getting a lot of amazing feedback in our survey and on our talk pages. Is Carol Moore here? No, she's here this weekend, if you can find her. She's remarkable. She's a DC feminist Wikipedian legend. And she's been here a while, six years, 19,000 edits. Tea House, a little haven of going back. I wanted to read it. Tea House, a little haven of tranquility away from the battles outside. I think that's nice. And if you've been around a while, you kind of get that. So here's an anonymous new editor. Uh, it was obviously an anonymous ed uh, survey. So. Um, overall, the execution of this idea has been brilliant. The Tea House is what changed me from being a gawker into being a very newbie editor. And I'm assuming a gawker means just a reader. Ryan Vesey, uh, I don't believe he's here this week, but Ryan's a wonderful editor. He's been a uh, Wikipedian for uh, one year, 10,000 edits, and he's a host at the Tea House. I have mentioned before, and I will state again, that I think the Tea House is the best thing I've seen happen to the encyclopedia since I started editing. And he's only been here a year. I've been here a little bit longer, and I'd say the same thing, but I'm biased, I guess. Here's another anonymous new editor. I like the name. I really like that the language is inviting. It is unlike many of the help pages that read more like a technical document, like Peter was showing us. The Tea House, overall, is very inviting and proves to be quite useful. I thought when we were getting the survey results back that there were going to be a lot of like negative, nasty comments, because Wikipedia is really good at telling their opinion and sharing our thoughts. There's a lot of this. And I'd say the majority of the feedback we got is really positive. And you can read it all on Wiki if you'd like. The vast majority. The vast majority. Was there anything in particular that you liked about your TS experience? There's nothing extraordinary about it. It just needs to exist and is a fundamental to the Wikipedia experience. Our next steps. Yeah, I think these are, uh, so these are, these are a set of uh, um, steps we came up with for our phase two of Tea House. So we've, we're through the pilot period. Now we're working, uh, the original team, uh, Seiko, um, Heather, Sarah, and I, are working to scale traffic and participation. Um, we'd like to get more questions, more intros, more new editors invited, um, and more showing up. We want to make the uh, processes of Tea House sustainable. We'd like to, to make it as, uh, as low touch for the foundation uh, fellows and the um, volunteer hosts as possible so that it can, uh, they can concentrate on interacting directly with the newbies. They shouldn't have to worry about doing, uh, doing a lot of the kind of uh, menial work that could possibly be scripted up. Um, increase the peer support. Uh, we, we had some newbies, uh, and I should say new editors, it's a bad habit of mine. Um, some new editors uh, interacting directly and supporting one another, um, and that was encouraging to see. Uh, but we didn't see as much of it as we wanted. We want to see more new editors um, offering support to other new editors uh, using Tea House as a forum for that. And uh, obviously we want to keep tracking uh, new editors who, who participate in Tea House and see if we can uh, demonstrate a sustained pattern of long-term retention among Tea House participants. Um, and then we've got a bunch of fun features that uh, we think might be good and also um, our uh, new editor participants might enjoy. So here's a, another example survey question. Uh, we asked new editors what would be most useful to them? What would they like to see most? Uh, live chat, um, uh, wiki projects, looking for new members, other ways to get involved with Wikipedia, um, links to help resources. Um, hopefully we can only link them to the best of help resources. And yeah, that's it. Um, Stop by and visit us today. WP colon T House on English Wikipedia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm Jon Harald Sebi, or John. Uh, I've been a Wikipedian for seven and a half years and working as a fellow for the past year on improving the translation experience on Meta, uh, MetaWiki. 
Does everyone know what MetaWiki is, or? I assume that's a yes. Uh, so my first project was working on the 2011 uh, fundraiser, um, and the goal there was just to get more translators and more translations, and also a higher quality of the translations we got. Uh, and to do that, we had uh, like um, a recruitment banner on top of uh, non-English Wikipedias, and we got 1,100 registered translators compared to 418 from the year before. Um, and in addition to that, we had uh, yeah, like 500 uh, active uh, translators who came in by other means. Uh, and two thirds of those were unre unregistered users. Uh, and the year before, there were 361, so that's an improvement, I think. Uh, 923 translations were started, as you see, uh, and 878 were completed, so that's a very high per percentage. Uh, and we also had translations into 112 different languages. Now those, aren't, those are like uh, languages that have at least one of the pages uh, completely translated. So there were uh, 10 appeals and 10 other pages that were up for translations. So uh, yeah, there's a lot to do if there's only one person. Um, yeah, and the focus was uh, on making the interface easier and um, basically just uh, making it very clear for what the user was supposed to do. Uh, and you can see here an example from, uh, from the Hindi translation of, uh, of Brandon's appeal, I think. Uh, and then you see the box on the side is uh, the status of all the transla translatable pages into Hindi. Uh, and then if you click a red link, that's not actually a real red link uh, because it gives you this nifty thing with, um, it has the English version pre-filled and the English original on top. So when something is translated in the edit box, you can still see the original above. Uh, and that's one of the improvements we tried to make for uh, uh, making it easier for people to contribute. Uh, and this is one of the status templates. And as you can see, it has uh, clear directions on top on what to what to do and yeah what to put there um, and yeah uh, the project report for the fundraiser translation is on that link so just go to meta and type in fundraising 2011 translation project report um, yeah uh, after the fundraiser finished we had a translator survey uh, for all the translators uh, who participated in the fundraiser and also translators who are um, subscribed to the Translators L mailing list where all translation requests are uh, published. And then 284 people responded and most of them had some translation experience from before, from either Wikipedia or TranslateWiki or somewhere else. Uh, and most of them learned about the translation via the central notice campaign that we had. So that shows that that was effective. Um, we, yeah, uh, we also asked the, asked the translators how they would like the experience to be next time, basically. Uh, so we asked them how they would like to be contacted, because uh, for the fundraiser, we only contacted them via, via email. Um, but we also added some other options, like do you want to be contacted on your user talk page, on your home wiki, on meta wiki, or... Uh, via RSS feed or something. Uh, and from that, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, from that the internationalization team, which has made uh, the translate extension and basically it does everything with languages like technology-wise in the foundation, uh, they made something called uh, translation notifications. Um, yeah, which you can see here. Uh, the thing is that uh, instead of signing up via a custom form, which we did for the fundraiser, it was very ad hoc. Uh, you have this, uh, this form, which is um, basically a MediaWiki extension that lets people register and uh, yeah, say how they would like to be contacted. So this is, uh, this is my registration here. So you choose which uh, languages uh, you want to sign into and yeah, uh, to translate into, sorry. Uh, and how often you would like to be contacted and how you would like to be contacted. 
Uh, we don't have RSS feed there because that would require a very different structure, but it might come in the future, but it's also the least requested uh, way of being contacted, so it's not a high priority. Um, and I'm not taking credit for this. This is the internationaliz internationalization team that did most of the work here, so they're awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, and to uh, to continue, we have a recruitment campaign, or it actually finished today. Uh, but we have uh, 100, and, well, 1,266 people who signed up for 118 different languages. Uh, the language number is not quite correct because there are a few duplicate languages, like a Chinese vari variants and stuff like that. Uh, but basically a lot of languages. And the campaign was only run for uh, the top 20 languages. So the fact that we have 118 different languages signed up is pretty good, I think. Uh, and I hope to uh, extend that campaign to other languages sometime, but uh, not right now. <laughs> uh, and I'm also, uh, yeah, I've also done some other stuff uh, in my fellowship, but uh, Right now, I only have three weeks left, so I'm working on you know, wrapping up and documenting some of the changes because there have been quite a few changes to the uh, translation structure on Meta. Uh, so I'm just trying to you know, uh, make it all clear and make it easy to understand for you know, people who are doing uh, translation stuff afterwards, which I will also do as a volunteer, but yeah. Uh, and other stuff, yeah, uh, we also changed the translation requests page on Meta. I don't know if you've seen it, but, and also um, made a new page called Request a New Translation, which is uh, for people who don't know how to do the, uh, well, set up a translation, they can request help there. Uh, and we're also reviving the translation committee, uh, which is uh, run by volunteers and uh, have done a great job with uh, managing translations in the past for fundraisers and, and the like. So we want to have more members of the translation committee, so if anyone is interested, then please just uh, give me a call, or yeah, you know what I mean. And um, yeah, that was it for me. Thanks. Okay, so my name is uh, Stephen Zhang. Um, you also may know me as that crazy guy who's obsessed with dispute resolution. And uh, I've been a Wikipedian since about 2008. So, okay, so my fellowship centered around dispute resolution, and uh, today I'll be telling you a bit about my project. So my research has centered around the dispute resolution processes themselves uh, on the English Wikipedia, and around improving how they work. Uh, my motivation for this research started last year because um, I've been doing dispute resolution for a number of years now. And I noticed what I thought were problems with the processes. Uh, I came up with a hypothesis that dispute re resolution is too complex and that there are not enough volunteers uh, to resolve all the disputes. So today I'm going to go over a bit of my research as a fellow, uh, which included a survey of the community, uh, as well as an analysis of dispute resolution forums. I also want to tell uh, you a bit about what the study showed what my plans are from here, and hopefully how you, call, how you all can get involved. So what is dispute resolution? Funnily enough, uh, dispute resolution is the process we use to resolve disputes, uh, primarily over article content and user conduct. And now due to the open nature of Wikipedia, uh, conflict can occur from time to time. And a lot of this conflict is resolved uh, through discussion pages, uh, user or article talk. Uh, but sometimes the involvement from a third party is required, and that's where dispute resolution comes in. Uh, third parties, uh, which are also known as mediators or dispute resolution volunteers, uh, work with the other editors to resolve the issues through consensus, compromise, and collaboration. Now, you may ask, why is dispute resolution important? Well, one respondent to the survey described Wikipedia as a machine and dispute resolution is the grease that keeps it all running, without which dispute resolution and Wikipedia would not function well. Effective dispute resolution can actually assist with editor retention. So a timely resolution generally means that editors are not bogged down in discussions 
where they could be working on building articles or spending time on other things that they enjoy. Uh, article title disputes are an excellent example of those. Uh, amicable resolution can also build a sense of camaraderie uh, between editors and in future they may collaborate on issues together. It can also result in better articles, more balance as a result of dispute resolution, high quality text and less edit wars. This also impacts how the world views Wikipedia. We may not think about it, but when people edit war over content, our readers notice. So, a couple of the results of the survey. I'm not gonna go all of them today, because it's huge, it's like 22 pages. But I ran this survey in April, and I selected uh, my sample based on the activity and dispute resolution for the last two years. 238 responses. Uh, the re results were really troubling. Um, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. Uh, dispute resolution was described as effective when the process was resolved in a timely manner with succinct discussions, cooperative participants, and experienced editors. However, uh, four out of five editors described their experience as a poor one. They were unhappy with it. And this was primarily due to the length of time it took, the behavior of other participants, or the lack of volunteers. Uh, I also asked about the effectiveness of dispute resolution and our arbitration process was rated as the best. One out of three uh, felt it was effective. In contrast, our Wiki Etiquette Assistance, which is uh, a forum for resolving small content issues, only one in 12 were happy. Um, our request for comment was used the most, uh, six out of 10. Uh, the least, was used, least used was formal mediation. Um, so yeah, overwhelmingly, uh, we can see here, so 70% of respondents had volunteered at some point, but resolution rate was only 47%, and that's based on my activity analysis. Um, I'm gonna be going over a little bit of the problems that I see in more detail. Okay, so um, by and large, uh, most respondents said the main problem was the time it took. Um, so I did an analysis for May, May just gone, uh, to capture a snapshot of the processes. So. I wanted to find out how long it took uh, between the dispute being filed and uh, being looked at, as well as how long it took to be resolved. Um, some of the results are there, um, and there'll be a link to the full results on the dispute resolution project, but on average, uh, it took five to 24 hours for a dispute to be looked at, and anywhere up to eight and a half days no, I beg your pardon, two to 28 days for a dispute to actually be resolved. Um, however, in some forums, they weren't resolved at all. Uh, and a subset of those weren't even looked at. Uh, to give you an example, the dispute resolution notice board, about half. Uh, formal mediation, however, resolved none. So we've got a bit of a problem there. Okay, so another concern was the difficulty it was to navigate and use dispute resolution, both as a disputant and a volunteer. Um, because there are a large amount of dispute resolution forums normally buried in a long page of instructions. Just so you know, this is the, this is the dispute resolution page. So when we ask someone to request dispute resolution, we send them here. And um, do, do, I don't think new editors really need to know not to call each other names, which is at the bottom of that pyramid over there. Um, and yeah, the problem with this page is a new editor looks at and thinks this. So, uh, in short, um, the, the things that I found, the main problems were 43% uh, said there's too many, 39% uh, said it was too hard, and 30% just didn't know where to go. Uh, disputes can also become very long and lengthy, uh, so long that they can't be effectively put onto a slide, but some are, I looked at one this morning, uh, 90K long, open for a week, uh, however it was almost resolved. So. Uh, and the problem is, some of these disputes are open for days or weeks, even before they're looked at. And this is mainly due to the length of the threads. Uh, no one can be bothered reading it. So this ties directly into the next concern, which was the fact that there aren't enough volunteers. Uh, we could have the best system in place for resolving disputes, but without volunteers, the process is useless. Uh, volunteers are essentially the lifeblood of dispute resolution. And that the problem is that there's not enough of us. Many uh, have done, 70% have done dispute resolution in some form at one stage. However, 
uh, I believe it was one third do so now. And this is mainly because of the complexity of the processes and the time it takes. It requires too much effort, reading long threads for many days, no way to track the status of a dispute, and no help in getting started. Newbies have to jump in the deep end and learn the hard way. So where from here? So I suppose from all this, I hope you agree with me that in order to resolve the issues with dispute resolution, we need to make some changes. I've identified a few needs that we need to fulfill uh, for both potential volunteers as well as uh, parties. Um, volunteers basically need the dispute to be short and sweet. They need to go, they need, and they need somewhere that they can get help. So if they don't know how to do something, there's help. And disputants just need it to not take forever and to know who's helping them. So in order to do this, I have done a few things. I've created, with the help of the foundation, a workflow system uh, for requesting di dispute resolution. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step form, and I'm going to briefly demo it now. <coughs> Okay, so basically, my idea is someone will come to this page. They have instructions on how to request a dispute resolution. So brief, descri brief description, what we can do, what we can't. Have they tried to use a talk page? Then they will be asked what type of dispute they have. So let's say uh, we can't agree on the use of the source. And then they'll be asked if they've used it anywhere else. Uh, let's say there. Ask them to put a link there. Describe where it is, what's happening, word limit, <laughs> and um, the desired outcome. So, he's probably going to hate me for this. <laughs> 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 this is not. This is how to not. This is how to not file a request for dispute resolution. And it'll basically summarise what they've done. The cool thing about this is, the logic behind it will know where to put it based on what they've said. So if they said it's a sourcing issue, but they've already tried the sourcing notice board, it'll put them somewhere else. That will help them. Um, and yeah, so that's that. Um, I'm really happy with that, and thanks to the foundation for that. Uh, let's go back to what we were doing before. Okay. Okay, so uh, make it easier for um, people to uh, do dispute resolution. And basically, we want a clear call to action so someone can go to a page and say, this is how you start getting involved. And discuss potential policy and technical changes. Um, some have been mentioned in the survey, such as uh, specific page blocking, so the ability to block someone from editing a specific page as opposed to everywhere. Um, a warning system, so if a new editor is about to breach the three revert rule, they'll get a warning. And even a robot um, that could help volunteers suspect detect disputes that need attention. Um, yeah, so basically after this, you've heard my speech and you've heard the stats and you're probably still wondering, yeah, that all sounds good, but uh, it's really hard and I have no idea how to do it. Well, it's actually not. Um, it's really easy to get involved. Just a quick question. Stand up if, you, if you've ever done dispute resolution at all.
Now, if you're still, if you're still doing it, stand, stay standing. So basically, we one day want all of you to stand up. Um, but we've created a basic guide on Wiki, um, and this is at the Dispute Resolution Notice Board, so it makes it really easy for you to get involved. Um, there's also a room upstairs directly after this, which is 404, um, when we've got a workshop. So if anyone's interested or just wants to pull ideas, there's a bit of food there as well, um, you're all more than welcome to come along. Um, there's also a wiki project for anyone that's interested. We have discussions there um, frequently about how to get involved and ways we can reform. And just ask us lots of questions. We're not going to bite you. Um, we're, that's what we're here for. Um, if only five out of this audience are, are inspired from our presentation and become involved, then that's five more than we have. Um, all you have to do is really try. Um, and lastly, I, I just want to thank a few people who have helped make this happen. Uh, Seco for all the support uh, over the last year, uh, my fellow fellows uh, for setting the bar so high, uh, the current dispute resolution volunteers who for their hard efforts, and to all the staff at the Wiki Committee for Nation for making this possible. And lastly, since I'm the last one, um, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you for your time, and we'll go over there for questions. Is this Hello. Working? Okay. Uh, I have the first question, evidently. Hey, Stephen. <laughs> Hello, Alva. Oh. So you mentioned that um, you know, volunteers are, are the lifeblood and, and we need to focus efforts on getting more volunteers to participate. I was wondering if you could elaborate on like, any precise ideas you have to do it, because it seems to me that if 70% of the people who um, participate in dispute resolution already are already being volunteers, then the, the challenge is to find ways to recruit from outside that group, which is going to take a bit more than, I don't know, easier help material. Like there, there needs to be ways into dispute resolution. It needs to be a more prominent area. Yeah, sure. Well, um, the 70% was over the last two years, so some of those don't do it anymore. And generally, people said it was too hard, it took too long, and massive walls of text, which someone wrote a policy a page about that recently. Um, <laughs> Generally, lowering the thing I want to do is lower the bar for participation. So word, word counts on uh, dispute resolution notice board. So um, or status templates. So it's easy to see, should I help at this? Or is this already being looked at? Or does this really need my attention? And some of these things have already been implemented. Other things are clear call to actions, which uh, Seco has helped me with. Basically, at the front of the page, a button which shows them how to volunteer. And if any of you want to look at that, it's actually at the Dispute Resolution Notice Board, or WPDRN. But yeah, to answer your question, lowering the bar and making it less scary. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, do you have any, um, what, are, what are the uh, requirements for becoming a volunteer? Or do, do you have any uh, methods for quality control, so to speak? Or? <laughs> No, not really. I mean, we have... The idea is anyone can get involved and it's not hard. We don't have... An, we don't have... We don't... The idea of limiting people based on edit count or how many disputes they've done before has been discussed and rejected simply because it sets the bar too high and essentially beggars can't be choosers. But we have... The way that the dispute resolution notice board is set up, all you need to do is read the discussion and make comment, and you're essentially volunteering. And that's why I created it back last year, is to make it easy. You don't have to know 50 templates. You just read and answer your question, pretty much. Does that answer your question? Well, how would you describe the motivations of, of people who volunteer for dispute resolution? And, and, uh, and are, there, are there not cases where you decide that some person involved in this process is, is not very good at it or counterproductive? Um, yes, we do have a few people that from time to time that, but we don't always say, no, you're doing it wrong. We more say, we, we try and guide them and say, I saw this discussion that didn't go quite so well. This is what I might have done in this situation. This is what I think you could do in future. 
So it's all really about guiding people and getting them involved. Everything is learning by doing on Wikipedia. Sometimes you learn the hard way. I'd like to make it a little bit easier, but I'm not going to write a 50-page manual that no one's going to read. Does that answer your question a bit better? No, but that's, <laughs> that's good enough, I guess. Okay. I am BD2412. Um, apparently nobody's heard of me, but I have 500,000 edits across Wikimedia projects. Um, and in terms of trying to find and retain new editors, I try and find people out there who I think will end up being like me, who have my sort of obsessive, compulsive, find something and want to put everything they know about it across all different uh, projects. My thinking, you know, I, I, I have a colleague who was telling me a couple of days ago that his father-in-law was uh, an amateur magician and went on Wikipedia and decided to add something for the first ever edit to an article on magic tricks and immediately was reverted and said, okay, well, I give up. You know, I tried to put something in and it, it got thrown out. And that was my first experience with Wikipedia seven years ago was I wrote something on, I added an article on a federal judge and at that time we did not have a uh, guideline in place saying that federal judges are inherently notable, which we do now. Um, and it got nominated for deletion. I was told, no, no, they're not notable, and I had to argue the point. And I, I would imagine that most people, their first ever experience with Wikipedia is that. Because when you come in, you, you don't know anything about what it takes to get information put in that's done correctly and that's going to stay in. Um, naturally, a lot of people come in saying something about, you know, here's my band or here's my elementary school or something like that. And it really is something that, that is never going to stay in no matter what. And the first response that they get is, we're deleting your rolling back or reverting your contribution. We're nominating it for deletion. We're putting a template on your page. And I, I, I think what you were talking about earlier with the tea house is like a really great idea for that. What I would like to see, and I think this is something that can be done at the software level is to say that if an edit is made, there should be some signal, some way for the, for the person who goes and looks at that edit, the person who's going to roll it back, to see that this is the first edit that this person's ever made, or this is one of the first dozen edits or 50 edits or whatever arbitrary number that this person has ever made, and they need to be engaged in a different way. Because you can't tell, if you're just patrolling pages in your watch list and you see someone added a sentence and it's ridiculous. You can't tell just by looking at that without doing little additional digging that it's that person's first edit or that they're very new. And it would be really nice to be able to see that and possibly even to have some kind of guideline or policy or even some kind of restriction in the software in place that prevents you from just going and reverting, rolling back, whatever, without um, directing that person to communicate with someone that is going to be able to welcome them into the community uh, the way that new, new participants need to be welcomed in so that they become, you know, become like me uh, eventually, hopefully. I, uh, I, I think that's a, a great idea. I, I've, I've, I've heard mentions of, of um, software solutions like that um, drifting around. I can't think of any particular project. I'm sure somebody here knows. Um, but the thing it always makes me think of, um, especially in terms of like making it harder to, re to revert uh, new editor edits or, or kind of forcing people to be a little more considered or think it more is that, is that bumper sticker, you know. I, I imagine a world where everyone, you know, has a great education for free and the military has to hold a bake sale to build a bomber. Um, you know, the idea that it makes it hard, make it harder to do uh, the things that, that we don't want to prioritize, uh, make it easier to do the things that we want to prioritize as a community. And thanks for all your contributions, too. Yeah, word. <laughs> yeah, I'll go next. My name's Joseph Bishop. I'm Fanuel B. Um, I'm very encouraged that, you know, when you um, asked people if they were satisfied with the dispute resolution that some of them they were saying that they apparently weren't. Um, I was very involved with the uh, murder of Meredith Kircher article, very controversial. Um, and I hope that you'll come take a look at that because I think the dispute resolution uh, process failed there. I actually and, remember that dispute. Yeah, and I'd like, to con I'd like to talk with you later about it, maybe you know, exchange emails. But the one, you, know, you talked about the um, 
um, procedures for dispute resolution. One thing I think is conspicuously absent there is that administrators are not sworn to uphold the law in the way that cops and judges are. Consensus that, you know, somebody is, you know, committed a biographies of living persons violation, that's not the same thing at all as going over the content very carefully, word by word, and saying if yes, this is sourced or yes, it isn't sourced. Um, you know, that's just one of my comments on, you know, perhaps what needs to be changed. A few of the uh, respondents to the survey did they desired more administrative control over content, but it wasn't a insignificant amount. I mean, all the results are in the full survey, which say the recommendations of the community as well as of myself. But I do think that at least administrators having some sort of role in dispute resolution, whether it's an active or a passive role, is probably a good thing. But yeah, I'm not really 100% sure if we should put the whole um, review an article and see if everything's correct is something we should get our administrators to do more. So maybe it should be something the whole community does. Yeah. Hi. All right. Um, this is a question for Sarah. Um, after uh, a few months with the tea, with the tree house, tea house project, excuse me. Um, what are some of the uh, some, what are some of the broader um, ideas or principles you've seen in interacting with newer editors besides just uh, your interactions with them on the question and answer section on that page? What are some things that um, editors who aren't part of the uh, tea house can do to make new editors feel more welcome? Do you think things like shortening or having more in-depth responses to questions, more personal responses to questions? Yeah, I know many of our first experiences with new editors often take place on talk pages, whether they're on articles or on that user's talk page, or maybe your own talk page, or articles for creation is another good example. Uh, I, I think the shortening and the person, personal touch, I mean, you kind of answered the question, honestly. I mean, by, by having a more personal touch, is so special, which sounds so simple and maybe even cheesy. But one of the things that we stress in the, tea, in the Tea House project is when a new editor or anybody, experienced editor, comes by, answers, asks a question, that you greet them. You don't just drop by and go, hey, I saw you were editing this article and you screwed up and boo, blah, 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 blah. And there are editors who are like that and that might work for some new editors. You know, there are people who do, uh, you know, react the same way back and that's just their functioning on Wikipedia. That's how they, that's how they roll. But we're, we've, we've found that people really do appreciate manners. It's kind of strange. And I'm being sarcastic, obviously, but Wikipedia doesn't have the best reputation you know, as being a friendly space. And by greeting people, whenever you're in a new place, whether you're coming to Washington, D.C. in Wikimania, you're at a restaurant, you're at a tea house, a coffee shop, you want to be greeted, ideally, if you're getting good service. And if we're providing our new editors good service as being volunteers, I th it's small, simple things that can make such a difference. When someone does screw up, be a little more gentler about it. You don't have to hold their hand like they're babies, but if people need help, tell them how to do it. Most people want to learn how to do things. That's one thing I can't stand. Even as an experienced editor, when I ask for help and someone does things for me without asking if I want them to. And a lot of experienced editors were really good at doing that because it's just quicker to get them to stop talking about it. You know. And that's one thing I would say you could do, is say, do you want me to do it for you, or do you want me to show you how to do it? Or do you want to log on to this IRC chat thing, and I can show you how to do that, and we can go over this together? Just putting a little extra time into it, I think, is such a, a, a simple and easy way to make a difference in someone's Wikipedia life. And of course, acknowledging the great work that they're doing, and encouraging them to stick around. There's been a lot of talk at Wikimania about how barn stars aren't doing the job we intend them to do by encouraging contributors to stick around. I think if we change the language in those barn stars and say, thank you for contributing, you're doing a great job, keep going, what are you working on now? Asking them questions on what they're doing and developing those relationships. I've been really lucky to have a lot of really nice new users come by my talk page and thank me for just participating in the tea house and like lending and welcoming them to Wikipedia with a special template and ask and saying, cool, it looks like you're editing punk rock records, albums, you know, there's a project for that. And they go, thank you. It's so simple. And maybe that gives you a few tips. And of course you can come by and be a tea house host also. 
and that doesn't take much work, so come on by. Well, We've thank already you had three people sign up, I've heard, so. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. It. My question is also for Sarah. You mentioned it sort of as I was coming down um, IRC, and I was wondering if you were planning on trying to um, develop any sort of live chat service that they could use that maybe, I mean, I don't know if IRC would necessarily be the best because of its sort of inherent yeah. confusingness. But. Yeah, and I think Jonathan and I will both answer this because we I have my opinion about IRC. I used to BBS back in the day. And when, until I became more heavily active in, in BBSing, the old bulletin board systems of the uh, few people here are nodding their heads, um, it's, I, haven't, I hadn't used IRC until like in 10 years, 10 plus years until like a year ago when I found out everybody hung out on IRC. And I was like, really? People still use that? Yeah. Don't we have other things? So we've been worried because one of my biggest problems is when I invite even experienced editors to come hang out on IRC. We created a gender gap room so we could talk yeah. about the gender gap. And new ed even experienced editors were like, I don't even get it. It is too frustrating to figure out. I mean, we're, we hang out on it, yeah. you know? But, so we want to do kind of a chat thing, and we have, have a fantasy to have an on-wiki chat. <sighs> Jonathan can talk a little bit more about what yeah. we might be doing yeah. for that. IRC, IRC is, is uh, ugly and confusing, right. um, and most people don't know what it is. Uh, so we do actually have an IRC help room that we opened up just uh, just recently. We we held off on it for a long time, but um, it's available through a, a link on the T House. Is um, it separate from the E and Help IRC chat? Yeah, room? it's okay. I think it's Wikipedia dash T hash T H dash Help. Um, but you can get to it from the Global Nav on T House. Um, we would love to have a uh, an embedded um, group chat system. Uh, it would allow us to do, I think, give people a richer experience overall, and certainly a richer experience than IRC, which is problematic in many ways. Um, but we don't currently have um, uh, resources. <laughs> um, it's a problem with and, that. Yeah. And also, I mean that you know we we most of the tea house is put together with with you know uh, a series of mirrors and uh, and duct tape and spit. Um, so uh, in order to actually, you know, um, add, add, add new features to MediaWiki, we, uh, we need to get uh, lots of grassroots support. So just keep telling people we need chat. And okay. Do, <laughs> do. And when, if you do want to hang out in the Tea House um, IRC channel, there's a cool bot that uh, Jeremy B. and Jonathan have helped us create that announces when a new question has been asked. So yeah. it's kind of a cool way to get triggered. Yeah, and that's in Wikipedia dash T House. That's, that's in Wikipedia. Uh, okay. I know. I'm confused I know. by the project we <laughs> created. Um, uh, but, and I also think the chat would be really cool because that's kind of the way the internet works now. You know, we have pop up yeah. chats and normal chat systems, oh, wow. and they'd be really cool. So. Probably, this is probably our last question, I think. I, I don't want to put too fine a point on something, a point that was already made, but. Um, just to introduce a metaphor to maybe explain the need even stronger, um, you know, the, the point that was made about sort of uh, the need to distinguish between sort of, I don't know, rookie editors versus power editors when it comes to, you know, someone who gets on who maybe is less friendly than they could be um, in <laughs> slapping around people who are new, if you will. Um, um, remember when we were all growing up and we got to that age where we still liked to go to the playground, but like we were a big kid. We weren't a little kid anymore. And our mothers would say to us, you know, you're getting pretty big and you're pretty coltish, pretty ungainly, and there's little kids on the playground. And some of them are in diapers, right? And you gotta be careful, because you're getting big. And you know, you run into that kid in diapers and he's just wham all over the place. And you're gonna decimate the kid, right? If we, you know, sometimes just having a little graphical something or other to show this one, this one's still a toddler, you know, so, so maybe just seeing an icon or something like that just to show who are the toddlers here. So don't, you know, just be careful. Don't run quite as fast near them, you know, just hold your cultish body and you know and check a little bit near them so you don't completely wipe them out near near the merry-go-round you know, something like we've that. actually kind of taught we've been that's in one of our brainstorming sessions i guess we have a name for it like the diaper resolution or something i don't would that be uh, but you couldn't have dr no we can't have dr <laughs> yeah. wpdr well yeah oh yeah and merit badges i mean do you I don't, and i know badges are sort of trendy right now but we have seen that 
this kind of acknowledgement, whether, hey, I'm fresh, I'm a newbie, let's all work together, I'm here to help out Wikipedia, is great, and people like that. If you see our, ho our guest pages, a lot of them say, yeah, I'm new to Wikipedia, I wanna help out, let's work together, and they're all really hyped. Yeah, you should, you should really go, microphone. you should really go, next time you're on your laptop, and look at the, the guest intros. It is inspiring and, uh, and, um, and informative to see, um, to see, to hear what uh, new editors now are saying about their motivations, what they want to do, who they are, where they're from. Um, you don't really get this kind of look in, into kind of the new, the new editor's psyche um, in a lot of other places on, on Wikipedia. I really think it's a, it'll be a blast. You should, you should do it. Just go. And you should make a profile too. Yes. And be like, hi, I've been here a while. Intro. But I'm, I you still love an Encyclopedia. An intro. Did yes. I say profile? Yeah, you did. WP not Facebook. Um, <laughs> but really quick about the badges, it is something we're thinking about. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about it, and we'll maybe have some information about that soon enough. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And if you want to be a fellow, come talk to us. <laughs>